Oh, well, welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us at RMU Arts and Humanities' first ever storytelling month. Um, last week, we opened the month with guest documentary, documentary filmmaker Kevin Schreck. Tuesday, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Stephanie Straussberg shared with us the process of weaving storytelling into photography. And her discussion of knowing yourself in the story has, was some great advice to storytellers of all mediums. Tonight, we are joined by three great storytellers with ties to Pittsburgh or Western PA, um, Megan and I being Yenzer adjacent. <laughs> And I'll get to that in a moment. But next week, we wrap up Storytelling Month with the crown jewel of RMU Storytelling with the 15th annual Creepy Conference. That's Tuesday, October 24th at 7 p.m. in the Wheatley Atrium. And this is the evening of spooky scholarship presented by students and faculty and a costume contest. And my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Pam Bukian, has been doing that for 15 years. And so it really, that's, I guess, it, you know, in academic standards, that's a very long time. <laughs> that's, that's like, you know a standard. I also want to remind you, if you are one of my students or one of Megan's students or a student in general, that there is set credit for this event. So make sure that you touch base with either uh, me or Dr. Penson, and we will uh, make sure that you get your set credit. Um, before I introduce tonight, there will, be, uh, there will be also be an open mic reading after our main readers, and the sign-up sheet is in the back right behind Ray with the camera. Um, please keep your reading to three to five minutes, and then um, I'll introduce you once we start. So once again, welcome to an evening of literature and conversation sponsored by the Roger Gillen Visiting Writers Series, RMU Arts and Humanities, and RMU Radio and Television. I'm Dr. Ed Karshner, Professor of English, and I'll be introducing our writers this evening. One of the reasons we chose October as Storytelling Month is because of the season. According to folklore, and here where my students are, their eyes glaze over because they hear this. They've already heard this in every class I've ever taught. October is a liminal, transitional month. Starting with the autumn equinox in late September, the wheel of time slowly begins to turn toward the long journey to winter. During this time, the veil between worlds thins, blurring the distinction between what was, is, and will be. The portal reaches its full opening on October 31st, remaining open until the winter solstice when the window slowly starts to close finally on January 6th. That's when Dr. Pambuki and I celebrate old Christmas. <laughs> During this time, our ghosts return to us, seek to communicate with us. The past intrudes on the present, and we are in a haunted time. Philosopher Mark Fisher writes that when haunted, our past reminds us of, uh, reminds us of lost futures, and we must, like Hamlet when confronted by his father's ghost, be reminded of our almost blunted purpose. So we gather here at this liminal time to think about art, writing, storytelling as a seance, to call our ghosts to us, and then exercise them out of our heads to make sense of them and the artistic medium of our choice, to purposely reconsider our haunted past and lost future. In this liminal time, we are also gathered in a liminal place. Ah, Pittsburgh. <laughs> think about it, a major city on an island at the confluence of four rivers, accessible only by bridges and tunnels. Is this urban planning or is this Tolkien? And for, as long, uh, for so long in its history, Pittsburgh was at the edge of the frontier, a gathering place to those who had gone beyond civilization and then beyond that. And Pittsburgh still holds this fort mentality. It stands guarded by hills and rivers against the chaos at its borders. Even us here on the western suburbs are one too many bridges too far. Suspect, wild. And my friend Jessica, who's here, where's Jessica? Oh yeah, you. <laughs> Jessica, who is, um, who is from, from the western suburbs here, um, more than once she's mentioned that growing up artsy here on the frontier's frontier was lonely. So this month is about giving Jessica and all of us a chance to rethink those lost futures. So we're not going to bring art to the western suburbs. Art is already here. We want to give it a space to speak, to take this liminal time in this liminal place and do what art has always done, provide a space to create to give voice to the purposeful or transformation of our internal and external landscapes, to say we are here too. So tonight, three writers with ties to not just Pittsburgh proper, but also to the land's west, a repository of ghosts, promises, possibilities, all managed by the stories we tell. Um, we will have time to ask questions after, uh, after each author has finally read, so, it, so hold your questions to the end. And um, so let's just get started. We'll start tonight with um, my friend and possible cousin, Jody DiPerna. 
we agree, we, we've, ag yeah, we've, agreed, we've agreed on so much that we've just decided that we must be related. <laughs> Jody DePerna is an award-winning journalist and longtime book lover. She is one of the founders of the Pittsburgh Institute for Nonprofit Journalism and covers books and literary life in Pittsburgh with a specific focus on writers and books in and about Pittsburgh, the Rust Belt, and Northern Appalachia. She is at work on Writing Down the Mountains, a book about Appalachian literature and how that literature helps all of us who live in the region to revitalize our communities, envision new futures, and just find comfort and solace in our voices. So welcome to uh, RMU for the first time, Jody DePerna. Um, before I get started, if anybody out there, student-wise, is uh, interested in journalism, find me later and uh, pitch me a story. I make no guarantees, but you should pitch me. Um, so this is a book about uh, Appalachian literature and how um, those writers help us to understand the place we live in and um, the way they interpret this place, separate from the way that it's portrayed outside of the region. So uh, I'm gonna read from one of the chapters. It's part memoir, and this is mostly memoir, and it's about the pressure to leave a place that's been economically forgotten, uh, which is true less in Pittsburgh now than it was when I was college aged, and uh, is very much true in a lot of places in Appalachia right now today. So this is titled The Beauty and the Harshness. There was a time in my young adult life when it felt like I lost a friend every week. Not that they died necessarily, although some did. I moved into the city at the end of the 1980s and began the process of coming out. It was the height of the AIDS epidemic and for a gay person in Pittsburgh or anywhere, death was never far. Keith Haring died, then Freddie Mercury. So many people died, but they weren't famous. You wouldn't know them. Just as much, there was a steady decline as people simply moved away. The exodus wasn't biblical, and the constant drip of leaving wasn't a daily or even weekly occurrence, but a diaspora did, did happen. The steel industry doomed, Western Pennsylvania's economy flatlined, everything just folded in on itself. And although the flight has now taken on mythic proportions in its retelling, and lots of us did stay, I do recall with sharp clarity times when I hesitated to cultivate new friendships, such was the relentlessness to the drain. You should move to Charlotte, to Phoenix, to Houston, to DC, to Seattle. That's what people said. Move someplace without rotting steel mills and abandoned train yards and old slag heaps. Move someplace that wasn't a union town, struggling to hang on in Regan's America. Move someplace without the long gray Pittsburgh winters pressing down. Move somewhere where the old man bars and union halls were raised or never were to begin with. Move to where things weren't painted with the residue and dregs of hard, dirty industry such that we could never get clean. Fill in the blank with that flavor of the month boomtown. That's where you should be. A place with shiny new developments and shopping areas and ever available office cubicle jobs. Those places made me feel shabby like I should watch the NASDAQ stock index breathlessly or be trendier or just want to shop more. In the mid-1990s, I'd lay in bed in my apartment in one of the city's more than 90 distinct neighborhoods and wonder if a place this big could simply disappear. I thought of abandoned skyscrapers and Three River Stadium crumbling and full of cobwebs. I pictured shuttered up homes along the rivers and creeks and through all the hollows of the city. I thought of kudzu covering the WPXI television tower. Maybe a Carnegie Library would remain standing, an oddity for tourists in a city of scant humans. I imagined Pittsburgh as the old gold rush place the family visited in an episode of the Brady Bunch. In They Will Put My Body Into the Ground, poet Jack Gilbert wrote, even Pittsburgh will vanish, leaving a greed tough as winter. I didn't know Gilbert's work back then, though he was a Pittsburgh guy and specifically an East Liberty Peabody High School guy. To be fair, I didn't know many poets then, but as a former literature major, I knew the moldy old canon. I had studied Wordsworth and Coleridge, Shelley and Byron and Keats. I read Milton's Paradise Lost. I think I even understood it. I read Shakespeare's sonnets. I learned how to parse poetry, how to read old style English, and I understood iambic pentameter. 
Those poems, though, were intellectual puzzles to master, an academic's Rubik's Cube or a math question in verbal form. None of them landed lower in my body than my forehead. Later in life, on my own, I found Appalachian poet Maggie Anderson, and poetry opened up in a new way, warming my body from my lower abdomen to my chest. While researching this book, I attended several readings by the great Kentucky writer, Crystal Wilkinson. She said once that poetry lived in her gut, and I felt that too. Of course, she's creating poetry, and I'm just taking it in, but it does seem to live in that place, inside your core. And I feel like if poetry lives where Crystal Wilkinson says it does, then I'm doing something right. I wonder now what it might have meant to read James Baldwin's poetry when we were living in the eye of the AIDS storm, or to know poetry that spoke to workers. How might I have understood myself, my town, my place, had somebody pointed me to poets who wrote in the modern vernacular of industry and cities and labor and capitalism? It was many more years before I discovered the verse of Jack Gilbert, who was a steel worker for a brief time, though most of his career was spent in Europe and then San Francisco, Pittsburgh's DNA is all over his work like a messy crime scene. In his poem, Searching for Pittsburgh, he writes, massive water flowing morning and night throughout a city, girded with 90 bridges, sumptuous shouldered, sleek thighed, obstinate and majestic, unquenchable, all grip and flood, mighty sucking and deep rooted grace, a city of brick and tired wood, ox and sovereign spirit, primitive Pittsburgh, winter month after telling of death, the beauty forcing us, forcing us as much as harshness. For me, Gilbert lights up the castaway forgotten places and people. He might have helped me understand why I stayed and saw beauty in such harsh, unappreciated places. Ashley Blooms grew up in an unappreciated place too. She grew up coal poor in a small place in Kentucky. In her brilliant 2022 novel, Where I Can't Follow, she combines a deep sense of home with a touch of magic to explore complicated feelings around loving a hard place and choosing to stay. Her protagonist, Marin, lives with her grandmother in the fictional town of Black Damp, Kentucky, named for the deadly asphyxiant mine gas. Blooms told me about the first time she heard of Black Damp from her miner father. She said they were going to be mining close to a much older mine that had been long since, ba since abandoned, and that was one of their concerns. They were not wanting to cut into an old shaft because it could contain black damp. But she also remembered just loving the sound of it, black damp. It sounded like being inside a coal cocoon, working in dank tunnels and shafts. Bloom's town of black damp is not a real place, though it is wholly real life Eastern Kentucky, a place ravaged by extractive industry and the opioid epidemic. It's also a place of extraordinary beauty, so ruthless and dramatic, it's hard to take in all at once. Bloom's writing, born from and of her home place, rings true in its contradictions. When we meet Marin, she's trying to care for her granny as the elder woman slides slowly toward dementia. She works at a convenience store, skips lunch almost daily to try to save even a tiny bit of money, and struggles to pay off a small, but for her, insurmountable debt. She has lived with her indomitable and sometimes difficult granny since she was little, since her mom left. Now, as an adult, Marin feels she owes it to her granny to take care of her so the woman can breathe her last in her own home. It's all so hard, and living on the knife's edge of poverty, Marin feels it all slipping away. And here, Blooms pulls a rabbit out of a hat. Not everyone, but many people in Black Damp get a little door, an interdimensional portal not wholly understood, but accepted by the population of the novel. It's an escape hatch or a paranormal exit. It's not clear where one goes after going through the door. Do they vanish into the ether? Does it lead to death, to an alternate reality, a different dimension? Do they go to the upside down? Nobody knows, but the mystery of the gateway is accepted. Marin's door appears in a field behind the modest house she shares with Granny. It's not really a door. It doesn't look like the door to your house or your bedroom closet or a Walmart. It's earthier and more organic, like a ball of dirt and moss and sticks and clay but Marin knows it's her door. She could just leave. She could leave behind feeling overwhelmed and the intense economic pressure. She could just walk through the door and let go of the rope she's clinging, clinging to with everything she has. There is a point at which Marin, beyond desperate, <clears throat> holds up in her bedroom, 
reading her mother's old journals, and she explains, I didn't want to make choices. I didn't want to explain myself. I just wanted to read. Every one of us, every kid who found joy in words on a page, or who wanted or needed to escape through books, can relate to Marin in that moment, even if we've never set foot in Eastern Kentucky. Marin stays, and not just out of obligation. She stays because she loves the place. She loves her friends. She stays because the mountains feel right, and it feels like home. When she thinks of leaving, she thinks only of going as far as Lexington, just a couple hours away. Blooms told me that sometimes she writes out of spite more than anything else, which seems as good a reason as any to sit down and make art. Telling stories that feel more authentic to my experience and adding them to that conversation so it doesn't feel so much like there are important things that are getting left out or overlooked, Bloom said, that means a lot to me. Writing about that struggle of trying to stay in a place that doesn't feel like it's always made for you, but it is also, also made for you, and you feel like you were made for it. That struggle of trying to make a home in a place that isn't really hospitable all the time. My wife is a therapist, and she thinks about things differently than I do. She tells me this thing about how our brains contain maps of our lives, a map of the people we are close to in the center, and it works its way out. I think of it like a heat map, showing the inner circle of one's own life and lightning and color or intensity as it works its way away. She tells me about research on how grief disorders our brain map. When someone dies, the map remains, and our brain has to hold conflicting information, that person's location in the map, and that that person is dead and gone. When that person is an anchor in your heat map, when they are at or near the center, it can throw everything off keel. Years after my mother's death, my brain is still holding conflicting information. I wonder if that's just true with moms. I wonder, too, if this applies to physical space and topography. Separate from the trauma and loss of 9-11, I think about how disoriented New Yorkers must have felt for the longest time seeing a skyline without the Twin Towers. At home, when I drive across the Homestead Gray's Bridge connecting Squirrel Hill to Homestead, I think of Carnegie's Colossus Steel Operation that is now an ill-conceived, sprawling shopping area. The smokestacks remain to remind us of what used to be there and that you can't replace that with a chain brewery and a movie theater. I also wonder this when I drive through western Pennsylvania and eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, when I pass deserted coal tipples and abandoned beehive ovens. I spent some time in Hazard, Kentucky, and I talked to a couple of fierce women there who fight for clean water and fight against mountaintop removal. I wonder how long it will take for their brains to adjust to the missing mountaintops. Our next reader is Jolene McElwain. Um, her writing appears widely in literary journals, including Cincinnati Review, West Branch, Florida Review, and the Best Small Fictions Anthology. Her writing has been nominated for several push carts, and she was named finalist for the Best of the Net, uh, Glimmer Train's New Writer Award, and Arts and Letters Unclassifiable, Unclassifiables Contest. Jolene was also a semifinalist in Nimrod's Catherine Ann Porter Prize and both American Short Fiction Short and Shorter Fiction Contest. She's taught composition and literary theory at Duquesne and Chatham Universities, and she was born and raised and currently lives in Catanning, PA. Her debut short story collection, which is available in the back, um, Seidel Creek, was published this spring by Melville House. It has received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and reviews from the Associated Press and NPR, as well as the Pittsburgh Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. And it also has received my mother's stamp of approval for a book that I needed to read. And so, and I did, and then, and then here is Jolene. And my mom is very proud of me for rubbing elbows with famous people. So, thank you, Jolene, and welcome to RMU. So, wow, Jody, what can I say? I can't wait for the book. Amazing. Um, let me get my glasses adjusted here because I'm old and I need these cheaters. <laughs> so first and foremost, thank you so much, Ed, for making this possible, and um, the Arts and Humanities Department as well, and thank you all for coming. Um, Thank you, Jody. really, truly, for all you do to shed light on the sometimes forgotten spot in the world, which is Appalachia. Um, 
really, truly, I can't wait to read your book. It's just, that was a wonderful excerpt to a teaser. Megan, what can I say? I've loved you and your work from afar for a very long time. This is the first time we're in the same room together, which is so cool. Um, for those of you that not, have not read the book yet, get a copy. Oh, kittens is my favorite. And I want to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, so congratulations on the publication, and thanks so much for letting me be part of this. Tonight I'll be reading three short pieces from Seidel Creek. Um, and there are 22 stories in the collection. They range from very, very short flash fiction to really long stories, up to um, 11,000 words. Um, the two of them that I'm going to be reading were actually published in Belt Magazine. Thank you, Jessica, so much. Um, they, they published those right around the time that my book was coming out. So I'm going to start out with a story that has a lot to do with um, why people leave why people leave Western PA. I was born, raised, and currently live here. I was asked all those same questions that Jody talks about. You know, why don't you just go away? Why don't you just leave here? What is there for you here? And then I had to answer the questions all over again. My son's 23, and a lot of people say, well, why aren't you pushing him to leave here? Why is he staying here? What's wrong? You know, so um, I don't know if that question comes up for any of you, but Eminent Domain, the story I'm going to be reading you is kind of my love letter to those who find themselves in a small rural town and see how the devastation, economic and environmental, sometimes both come into play. Wendell Berry uh, talks about the devastating effects of corporations on rural America. And um, this little piece, I hope, shows why one character feels stuck, why she might need to leave. Eminent domain. Cheeser warm, warms up behind me covers my eye sockets with his cold hands and breathes into my neck the word guess. He has something to tell and he loves rumors so much it makes him tremble. When he spreads it, his fingers always fiddle at his watery eyes, his watery lips. He always pulls at his cigarette, slows down, excels to make me wait. But tonight, I know the story. Still, I'll let him tell it to me like it's new because I know how the telling drops his clothes off quicker. But let me put it to you so you know it right. My pap, in the midst of all his talk about shifting power grids, the high and low voltage, about Marcellus Shell, the dry and wet gas, mentioned they were going to rebuild the substation and made promises to replace and raise all those wood poles clean from Toby Furnace to Bennett's Corners. But no matter how high you string those wires above the ground, a body still feels the prickly snap underneath them, like mom's little cuticle scissors nipping at my skin. First time I walked there, I thought sure bugs were biting at my ankles. I mean, I swore it. Checked my skin for red bites, fire ants threading my hairs off, but nothing. And the grass was extra slippy, even when it wasn't damp. We'd take guys out there through that grass to the shed to party to forget we were stuck. The shed was smack dab under the power lines. We had some good times there, I'm telling you. The guys chirping like goslings, talking about shooting up whitetails, trapping bunnies, fishing monster trout at the sidle, lifting the bodies of their Fords and Chevys until we filled their mouths with Henny and Red Bull. After a few, they always sprayed, swayed their words out, got quiet and cuddly, whispery and soft. But then some suit from the company put up a no trespassing sign, and we moved our party to the old baseball dugouts for a while. Then we got kicked out of there, too. The shed's now a crime scene, and we lost our spot. Someone's been killing cats and storing them in there. Cats. Sharky Smell's ex-con uncle said there was over 200 in there. I know the guy who's doing the killing, and I know why. Pap told me when he was lit on homemade pruno Sharky's uncle taught him to make. Guy, this guy doing it, he thinks the cats are the devil. This place can do that to you. I've seen it do worse to smart people. Cheeser pulls his hands away, says, cats strung on lines, gutted like little wilding whiskers all pointing straight to hell. Can you believe it? Don't just make you sick. Don't just break your heart. I nod and kiss his neck. I feel how warm he is in certain places. And he says, who do you think could do that? No idea. I say, it's always better to keep him pondering something when we get to it. And when we're done and he's tugging his jeans back on and I'm worrying he just shot something that might 
grow up in me. I have other things to mull over too, because as much as he's nice and handsome in a lonely kind of way, and I can picture staying here and having a life, I know I have to hop in my car and drive as far as I can get if I want to ever be anything that ain't a few steps away from crazy. So that story kind of plays into the um, stereotype that we have to leave or we're stuck here or it's a terrible place to be. But it also talks a little bit about why and how corporations can truly, with exploitation of natural resources, make us feel unhomed even in our own home. The next story is called The Fourth. It's a little different. It celebrates, um, I think, the ways families celebrate together. It's it, on the 4th of July. Um, and it shows a little bit, I think, about the way we nurture each other. Uh, several of the stories in this book deal with different ways that we deal with PTSD. And um, this is just one of them. The fourth. Heat, lightning, midsummer, nothing to fear. Storm's not coming, just the lightning flashing the sky. Aunt Meg, Aunt Mo, and Mom gather up the last of the coconut frosted cupcakes. The only brownies left are the dried out ones with nuts. They roll the tops of the chip bags, clip them with clothespins from the line while we chew the juice out of wax bottle candy and hit shuttlecocks high into the sky. Dad folds lawn chairs and leans them against the porch. The light of a cig makes a string path in the deep dark while fireflies dot around him. He's laughing at Uncle Hank, who's sauced on something more than beer, who's singing, who's talking about heading down to the Eagles to sign the book. They open on the holiday, Aunt Mo asks, sing-song voice. Aunt Meg shakes her head at Uncle Hank. You've had enough, I'd say. What? He says. They probably hit the Echo Spring. Even Uncle Ron looks mellow. I see him smiling a bit by the firelight when Dad calls out, Hey, Uncle Sirius, you going to help clean up? Uncle Ron shakes his head, crosses his ankles, and takes another sip. He smiles and shakes a finger at his Ronnie and Rick, sneaking beers from deep in the metal coolers. Out of nowhere, a brilliant Queen Anne's lace lights up humongous the sky, then the boom. I watch a line of light zip wiggle from the treetops to the middle of the big smoky afterburn, blooming again, this time into blue allium. Then that boom. My cousin Keith pretends he's been shot. He falls to the ground. I don't understand at first, and then when the next four blooms come together in the sky, I'm ready. Wait for it. Boom, 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 boom. And I hold my hand over my heart and fall to the ground. So does my brother and my other cousin, Michelle. Our moms run to us. They think we've been hit. No, they want us to stop. They keep looking back at Uncle Ron, at Aunt Mo, patting his knee as they pull us along with them to round up my oldest cousins from the house, Beth and Linda. They hand them the smoke bombs and snakes, and we walk up together to the alley under the street light. Beth lights one of the small charcoal pills with the end of her cigarette, and a snake grows. He'll be okay, she says of Uncle Ron, but I can't stop turning around to see where our moms have taken him. Is he going to be sick? No, he just doesn't like those big booms, that's all. He's okay. The smoke bomb bleeds green fog into the alley, leaves a green stain on the asphalt. Another bleeds red. Something about the war. Shell shock, Linda tries to explain, but I can't quite, don't quite know. Mom says it again, whispers it, shell shock, when she's scrubbing out the brownie pan, how hard she's working the edges to get that chocolate from it. I eat the last of the jello, avoiding the pieces of pears in it. When I lick my finger, I taste that smoke bomb. When she says, it's these flashbacks he gets, I feel the boom, 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 boom of fireworks still in my chest. I see Uncle Ron's grimace and my Aunt Mo's arm around his shoulders when we fall, 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 fall to the ground. I see Beth's lit cigarette making those snakes dance, my brother trying to pick up the ash snake without breaking it into so many pieces, into nothing but dust. 
So I was just down in Alabama to visit with a friend that's in the southern part of Appalachia, and we were doing uh, an event together. And I have to warn you, like, I feel like I have to give a content warning. I wish they would have put one in the book sometimes. But there are very heavy stories in the book. And my friend Dave said, you know, she writes about cockfighting and child fighting and miscarriages and stillbirth, you know, simple, easy, light stuff like that. <laughs> so I'm going to end tonight with a little bit lighter story. And this one is um, going to just be an excerpt from one of the longer stories in the book called You Four Are the One. It's a story about how a neighborhood comes together around a potential tragedy. Cinta Johns is one of the characters. She's pregnant again after multiple miscarriages. And um, there's a young girl, Lainey, who's 11 years old, and she and her three friends are on a mission this summer, summer of the fifth grade year. They just learned what menstruation is. And um, they're going to try to help save Cinta and her unborn baby. Um, I think that one of the reasons this story ended up being in this book is because one of the things my agent said when we were getting ready to send it out was, it's so dark. We have to put a few stories in there that are a little bit lighter. And it came quickly to me which ones needed to be included because during the pandemic, during the lockdown at least, um, that's when we were putting the last pieces in. And I definitely became highly aware of how important neighboring is. So this story is about neighbors. It's called, uh, it's come, this is an excerpt from You Four Are the One. That first week of her strict bed rest, we stood at the base of her old black oak, the lichen-dressed side, hemmed in around Cinta John's. Captured by her smallish hill of a pregnant belly, we waited quiet as cobwebs as she stilled herself within the cradle of macrame hammock. Her manicured hands, matte pink nail beds, arctic white tips, rested over our filthy ones, nails jam-packed with the blackest soil from filching night crawlers to ensure a trout harvest for Cinta John's and her growing baby inside her. She guided our palms across her belly, said, wait, 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 the baby's readying to kick. The neighbors had started hand-thinning their fruit trees, and Nana, my great-grandma, too, far too old to climb a ladder, troubled by the lace bugs on her azaleas, planned to include our good eyes in her insect war. She yelled over the hedge from our house, white hair lifting in the wind, you bring me ladybugs, many, many. She'd have to wait, no time for gathering lace bug eating ladybugs. And then it happened. Like the ground swell, some long snouted mole might push up through perfectly hard dirt. That baby's foot or knee or elbow heaved up. Our heads buzzed. Spots swirled our eyes as we held our hands against Cinta John's bare, warm belly skin. We might have passed out had Cinta not clutched us with her smile. Feel that? Yes, we did. Feeling that baby move filled us with so much hope, we knew we weren't ever going to let this baby die. Too many deaths had already come to our neighborhood, in person and in place. Old Mr. Riggle, who was the exact same age as Nona, had a heart attack while planting his onion sets in the spring. Rolo's chocolate shop had caught fire, likely would never be built back up, and the Polish deli that had been selling the best pierogi in Haluski since Nona was my age had gone out of business. The Baker twins' two beagle dogs got some virus that killed them. That baby's kick gave us all the spirit we needed to repaint Cinta John's white fence the whole way around the back while Sheppy rolled in the grass and sniffed squirrel and rabbit poop, even ate some. It gave us the strength to move at least a hundred ton of gravel from around the shrubs and hosta Cinta's husband was transplanting to make room for a family swing with a canopy, a future play area for the baby. It gave us steady hands to paint in the tiniest detail each of the bird boxes with Cinta John's favorite flowers, dwarf irises, and lily of the valley. All of this was much more exciting than being at the pool and trying to ignore everyone bikinied who developed, all that comparing would surely happen. At Cinta John's house, we weren't four flat-chested nerdy girls in one pieces. We were a part of her support team. That, according to mom, included Cinta's husband when he wasn't at the mill, our moms and aunts, and even Nona, though she was totally preoccupied with her garlic falling over, 
worrying which curses would hit her gardens sent by the woman across the river and her il macchio, her evil eye. Thank you. All right, and our final reader for the night is Megan Lucas. Is the, she is the author of the award-winning novel Songbirds and Stray Dogs, which is for sale in the back, and the brand new collection Here in the Dark, also for sale in the back. <laughs> Megan has published over 30 short stories, and The Monster Beneath was recognized as Distinguished in Best American Mystery and Suspense 2023. Megan is Pushcart and Best of the Net and Derringer nominated. Songbirds and Stray Dogs was chosen to represent North Carolina in the 2022 Library of Congress, the Route One Reads program. She teaches creative writing at Robert Morris University. Very glad to have her here. And also in the Great Smokies writing program at UNC Asheville. She is the editor in chief of Rec and Review. And I should say that her, her collection here in the dark won a rare two thumbs up from both my mom and dad. <laughs> so <laughs> it's definitely worth checking out. So it's my pleasure to welcome back to campus, Megan Lucas. Hey y'all. So I've been on tour for the last two months with this new book, and so I'm not even like 100% sure what state I'm in right now. Um, but I want to tell you one of the most exciting things about touring is that they ask you in every city that you go to who you want to read with. And it's an opportunity to meet writers who you're a little bit obsessed with, um, and that's why Jolene is here because I read her collection and it was the best collection that I have read in a really long time. And um, I teach a number of her stories and it's just, it's thrilling to be able to be here and to uh, listen to her read. And then Jody, of course, is one of my besties and I'm just thrilled that her new book is coming and that you guys all got to hear some of, some of what's coming. So I have had the pleasure of reading here at RMU, I don't even know how many times in the last two years or so, and so I ran into the problem of not knowing what to read. Uh, because I have published a lot of stories, but I've also read a whole lot of stories here. Um, but most of my stories are about the, the precariousness of living in a female body. And um, that's what I'm gonna read for you today. This little girl, though, in this story, Buttons, is the little girl that I wish that I was, that she has a strength that I didn't have. And so I wrote about her, maybe, maybe to give myself some of that strength. Tilly didn't want to go play outside. She didn't want sunshine on her face or to make mud pies. Mima wouldn't let her ride her bike down the dirt road to town, and Tilly couldn't imagine using the heavy yellow phone in the kitchen to call someone from school to come over to play, not with Mima's collection all over the house. She wanted to stay in. She wanted to read that new book that she got at the library and wait until Mima fell asleep in her chair and then sneak some of the cookies from the jar real quiet. But Mima said Tilly was making too much racket for her to hear her stories. And besides, young girls need fresh air to grow strong, she said. She also said that Tilly should be seen and not heard and should keep her knees together and that she should always wear a smile, even if she didn't feel it on the inside. Mima had a lot of opinions on how to raise young ladies. Most of them had to do with Tilly not growing up to be like her mama. Like somehow it was mama's fault what became of her. Tilly patted Buttons, who didn't move from his place on the couch, and rolled her eyes, and then remembered the new shoes that Mima had bought her for the first day of school next week, and ran to the back door. Wear your rubbers, Mima called. Don't go getting those new ones all muddy and ruined. Tilly sighed and frowned and looked up her beat up, three sizes, two large hand-me-down boots. The only good part about going to a new school, a new grade, was the new things. Mama didn't ever have a lot of money for new stuff, and Mima neither. Tilly was used to getting her clothes secondhand, her cereal in a bag, and making do. But the first day of school meant new shoes, new pink rubber erasers, and pencils that no one had chewed on yet. And it was a tiny high point in an otherwise shitty summer. But there was nothing to do in Mima's yard except go down to the creek. No swing, no neighbors, no sidewalk for hopscotch like at her old house, and those stupid boots would get stuck, and if she got mud on the new shoes or stained them, she'd get the switch. So she'd just have to be careful with the boots. She had petted Buttons, who didn't move from his basket by the shoes. The screen door smacked closed behind her, and she stood on the back step with her hands in the pockets of her shorts and wondered how long she needed to be out here before Mima would fall asleep 
and she could go back inside and read her book in peace. The afternoon sun made the skin on her arms and her neck tingle. She walked towards the shade by the creek. She picked up a long stick along the way and decapitated some black-eyed Susans. She squatted in the shallows and watched the clear water bubble by. She floated a stick and wondered how long it would take to get to the next county. Maybe the next time she'd bring a note in a sandwich bag, tie it to the stick and see if she could get a pen pal in Tennessee or even Georgia. She picked some pretty stones and put them in her pocket. The water was ice cold, always freezing, coming down from the mountains. Mima told her how they used to keep their milk cold by putting it in the creek back when she was a girl. Tilly imagined walking out to the creek in her jammies with a bowl of cereal and laughed. She picked some daisies and pulled the petals out, throwing them into the air and running beneath, pretending the petals were snow, pretending they were rice at the end of the wedding and she was the beautiful bride. Pretending they were the soft caresses on her cheek where her mother's long hair tickled Tilly's skin as she kissed her forehead. She wondered if her mother still had long hair, or any hair at all. Mima said not to think about that kind of stuff, but it was hard not to. A branch snapped on the far side of the creek and she looked up to see eyes on her. Her cheeks went hot. He had seen her acting like a baby with the petals. Take a picture to last longer, she said, and he walked closer to the creek and he was a lot bigger than her, red-faced, sweaty from the heat. She tried to lift her foot to run back to the house, but the boot was stuck, of course. She didn't want him to see her struggle to know that she was trapped. I've seen you here before. I've never seen you here before, she said. I've seen you, he said, and that old lady and that little black dog. He picked up a stick and walked to the edge of the water. Goosebumps rose on her arms. She shifted her weight and rolled her ankle to free that boot. She didn't like that there was only six feet of air and some thigh deep water between them. He was peeling back the bark at the end of the stick. It looked sharp. He whipped it through the air like one of those long bendy swords and it made a swishing sound. What grade are you in, she said. I'm in third next week. I'm starting fourth, he said. You're big for fourth. We move a lot, he said, and sliced the air with a stick. He kept moving closer, standing in the water up to his knees. You're gonna hit me with that stick and I'm gonna be pissed, she said. So move, no one's making you stand there, he said. Her boots wouldn't budge. She slipped her feet out of them and stepped back into the dirt and then scrambled up the bank in her socks. He looked at the boots trapped in the muck and smiled. He crossed the river and slashed at her boots with a stick, a loud whack echoing as the wood met the rubber with all of his preteen power behind it. You should let me hit you with this, he said, smiling. You're crazy, she said, stepping backwards in a run but tripping over a root and landing with an oof on her belly. Her heart hammered. The air parted and reparted above her as the womp womp sound of a helicopter slowing as he beat it. She scrambled to get her feet beneath her and then ran behind a tree. He stood five feet away, a foot taller and twice as heavy, slicing the branch through the air, but his eyes never left her face. You ever been switched, he said, spanked? I bet it feels like that. I'll do it across your butt so no one will see. I'll scream, she said. You're no fun. No wonder you got no friends. I got plenty, she said. I've been watching. I've seen everything, he said. Her face heated and her belly clenched and she wondered, could he see into the windows? You're a weirdo. Who has no friends? Who has time to spy on girls? I'm new, he said. I haven't met anybody but you, but when I do meet people, I'm going to tell them what a baby you are and maybe some of the other stuff I saw. You're a jerk, she said, looking over her shoulder, engaging the distance to the house and wondering if she could make it without the feeling of the sting of the stick slice across her shoulder blades or her calves. She didn't hear him. He was fast and quiet, and she was on the ground again with the air pushed out of her chest and the boy sitting on her belly before she could even scream. What if I just poke you, he said, pressing the sharp end of the stick into the soft flesh of her upper arm until it felt like her skin might just split. She didn't have the air to cry out, and she was glad she didn't want to give him that pleasure. He moved the stick to press into her belly just below her ribs. She only grunted. He moved to the baby fat on her inner thigh and pushed hard. It burned and it brought tears to her eyes. She felt the skin tearing. She imagined him drilling a hole through her leg and pinning her to the dirt with a stick before moving her arms to do the same. Like one of those butterflies at the museum. Trapped and spread wide for everyone to touch, to see, prone and defenseless. Okay, she whispered, choked. Okay, he was so shocked he tipped over, and finally, with the weight off her belly, she could breathe. I'll let you poke me, she said. Wherever I want, wherever I want, he said. He was panting with excitement. Wherever you want, if, if what, if what, if what, he said. If I get to poke you first, she said. He thought about that. 
She thought she could see the gears of his brain moving. He looked down at his body and then at the stick and then at her face and his eyes narrowed. Deal, he said and stood holding the stick out to her. Tilly stood slowly, brushing the grass from her shorts and wiped her hand on her shirt, a bruise blooming on her leg, and it hurt to let her thighs touch. And she took the stick from him, and it was warm where he'd been gripping it. And she thought about running, about how fast and quiet he was, though. She thought about breaking the stick in half, but then he'd have even more sharp ends to torture her. She ground her teeth together and thought where he would, she wouldn't want him to poke her. There was a long list. But she needed to pick the right one the one that would stop all of this. And she'd been watching his eyes, and she knew what he planned to do to her. And then she knew. Come on, he said, smiling, impatient to hurt her. She struck fast. He screamed like an animal and bent over double. She knew she should be running back to the house, slamming and locking the door, but the noise coming out of his mouth froze her. She'd heard it before. Through her window, in the hot night, the scream of a baby bunny being eaten by a cat. Shit, he screamed, you aren't allowed to go for the eye. You didn't say that, she said. Everyone knows that, he said. She shrugged, I didn't. Let me see. The eye was swollen shut, blotchy, red and white skin with some purple starting at the corner, but she didn't see any blood and she thought that was probably good. She moved so fast that she hadn't felt the stick enter his eyeball. It was just all soft and then hard, but when she'd pulled it out, there'd been resistance. She bit her lip, you might wanna get your mama to take you to the doctor. She's going to whip me. We ain't got no money for that, he said. He was crying now, and that sound was somehow worse than the bunny noise. My daddy's going to kill me. Tilly chewed her lip and sighed, come on. Come inside. I can fix it. You can, he said. Yeah. Is your daddy like a doctor or something, he said. You think I'm living here if my daddy was a doctor? Shit. Is your mama a nurse, he said. Tilly had him by the upper arm and was pulling him back to Mima's house. Just shut up. My Mima is sleeping, you gotta be super quiet. And here, close your eyes, I'll lead you. It'll be easier on your hurt eye if they're both closed. Keep them closed, close your eyes. She led him to the bathroom and sat him down on the toilet seat and she ran cold water over a washcloth and wrung it out and held it to his face. Hold this, she said, holding his hand, or grabbing his hand. Don't move, I need to get a couple of things. And she tiptoed past buttons to the junk drawer in the kitchen for the sewing kit and the supplies. And she checked to see if Mima was still in her chair, sleeping with her head tipped back, mouth open, buttons in her lap. Tilly snuck back to the bathroom and closed the door quietly behind her. Cookies, he said, looking at the tin. What's wrong with you, she said. When does this ever mean cookies? He shrugged, I'm hungry. Move your hand, let me see. She had to use her fingers to push the flesh of his eyelid back to see the ball. She sucked in air through her teeth. There was a dark gash to the left of his pupil and the white had turned bright red. It reminded her of when birds pecked at Mima's tomatoes. Her stomach turned over and bile rose in her throat and she took a deep breath. It's just a scratch, she said, I can fix it. Happens to Mima's dogs all the time. What, I'm not a dog, he said. Pugs, she said, she loves them, totally obsessed. They have these giant eyeballs and they get scratched all the time. And then you put some ointment on it and then you just sew it shut for a day or two and then it's fixed. You just gotta let the eye rest. If you keep moving it, it doesn't heal, and they go blind. Blind, he said, and he started to breathe real quick and shallow, his shoulders jerking up and down. I don't believe you. Well, you can just go home, she said. No, she's had like 10 pugs. I know it's weird, but it's true. He nodded. She squeezed a line of ointment from the metal tube onto her finger and rubbed it in his eye. Jesus Christ, he said, shh. She said right in his face, her spittle dusting his cheek. It hurts, he said. Sorry. I'm gonna need you to hold still for this next part, though. I don't wanna jab you in the eye with a needle. Can't I just hold it close, he said. No, then it won't heal. That's what the vet said to Mima. But that's a dog, he said. Tilly rolled her eyes. You're, you're not gonna forget? Even for a second in the next two days, you wanna be blind? He sighed, no, no, you're right. You gotta be quiet, too. We can't wake Mima, or she's gonna march us over to your mama, and then you're gonna get switched. He whimpered as she slid the needle into his lower lid between his eyelashes and then the upper and pulled it tight. Just like darning a sock or putting a patch on her jeans and again and again, and the skin came together in the seam, the black of the thread stark against his pale lashes. Okay, she said, just one more thing. And then she reached into the sewing kit and pulled out a round black button. What the heck? He said through his good eye, you're not sewing a button on me like a doll. That's probably just like a dog thing to make the dog look like more normal or something. We don't have to do it. It's important, she said. 
Something to do with the pressure on the stitches. You don't want to rip these stitches, and I ain't that good at sewing. Besides, I got these sunglasses for you to wear. Start thinking about how you're going to hide this from your mama until we can take the stitches out. He moaned a little as she attached the button and then stood back to look at her handiwork. The button was a little off-center and horrifying. It made her think of an old doll that she'd found in a puddle at the grocery store once. Perfect, she said, just like buttons. She dusted off her hands and put them on her hips. He sighed. Okay, so now we just got to get you out of here before Mima wakes up, he whimpered a little bit. She was so distracted by the relief that she felt for having him almost out of the house that she forgot to tell him to close his good eye. And when they got to the back porch, he was green. Which, which one of those dogs was Buttons, he said, gesturing to the ten taxidermy pugs that filled Mima's house. They all are, she said. That's the best part about pets. You never really lose them. When they die, you can know what happened to them. You're not worried about where they are or what they look like. They look cute forever. Was it their eyes that killed them, he said, pointing to his. Some of them, she said, with a shrug. You're a crazy bitch, he said. Well, I thought you had been watching me, she said. I thought you knew that. I don't hide it. He ran. She smiled until she went back inside and found Mima's eyes on her, buttons still in her lap. You can't treat boys like dogs, Tilly. Tilly thought about the look on his face, the wild pleasure in his eyes as he pinned her down and pressed that stick into her thigh, the same look that Daddy had the day that he took Mama. Why not, she said. Thanks, y'all. All right. Well, let's see. Let's um. We'll we'll take like a, about a five minute break to just sort of re restructure ourselves. The the sign up for, sign up sheet um, is there in the back, and uh, just let me let me close this out. Um, so um, I opened the evening with some thoughts about liminal time, and it seems in this technical day and age, such musings about ghost pasts and lost futures are quaint. And I think that's what just what we were kind of talking about that nostalgia. Um, but I think our ancestors had it right. Sometimes it's good to take a moment to think about where we've been, where we are, and where we would like to be. And what better time than during the dark, cold times of harvest and falling of leaves. And as RMU enters its own time of regeneration with a new president, a new provost, soon new schools, and, um, and our new arts and humanities certificates in creative writing, writing in the workplace, and content creation, uh, what better time to gather around the fire with friends and tell stories that orient us toward tomorrow. So in closing, I would like to thank my arts and humanities colleagues, Dr. Pambukian, Dr. Ruzik, Professor Lucas, uh, Dr. Holtz, and Professor Ames for being such great partners. And I'd also like to thank my department head, Dr. Heather Penson, and my dean, Dr. Uh, Frank Hartle, for their support of the arts at RMU. I'd also like to thank Joe Hale, back here, Ray Zapparoni, back there, from the RMU television and radio for recording us tonight for a special edition of Lit Out Loud. And I'm always appreciative of these two guys. It's, you know, it's a Thursday night and here they are. <laughs> so, so thank you both. They're good people. I'd also like to thank Dr. Tim Jones for the, uh, of the AMC for letting a bunch of writers and lit people swarm the podcast studios because we're really starting to become a nuisance over there. And so he's been very, very, very nice about that. And finally, I'd also like to thank our new friends from Follette and the RMU Spirit Store. Thanks to them. Um, thanks to them. And if you would like a copy of Jolene or Megan's book, you can purchase them in the back. Um, they will be back there until 8.30. Well, I'm not sure we'll be here that long, but anyway. But they will be there to sell you the books, and I'm sure Jolene and Megan would sign them for you. And again, I'd like to thank Jolene, Megan, and Jody for reading for us tonight, and I hope that you come back. Um, one of RMU's many taglines is small enough to care, and I'd like to say that we are small enough to get away with more. And that because we are small, there is a willingness of the faculty and staff to come together, just like tonight, to cooperate like tonight, and put the needs of our students first. And this truly makes RMU a jewel out here in the wilderness. Um, so like I said, we'll take a short break, and then, um, and then the sign-up sheet is in the back. Uh, like I said, keep your reading to about three to five minutes, and I'll start, I'll just introduce you to come up as we start. So, kind of reorient yourself, go check out the books, and again, thank all of you for coming. All right, I think we're ready to start the open mic uh, portion of the evening, and we'll start off with um, my one of my favorite people here, Sarah Rose. I wanted to tell a scary story, but then I realized I didn't have any, but I have a lot of stories about being a mom, and that's basically the same thing. 
I have a strong belief that life teaches us about gravity. From the day we're born until the day we die, it is constant lessons in gravity. I learned about gravity when I was seven years old. My tiny hands let go of the chains of the swing set in the backyard of Ridgecrest, California. I soared forward, landing on my feet, my knees buckling, my face planting into wood chips, my mouth filled with blood and dirt. I cried, but I also flew. It was my first taste of real freedom. I learned about gravity when I was 16. Brian broke up with me between third and fourth periods in the hallway. He called me a whore for not giving him a blowjob in the backseat of his dad's Kia Spectra. I cried, but I also took a step into womanhood. I knew what it really meant to be a woman that day, to be called a whore if you say yes, but to also be called a whore if you say no. I learned about gravity when I was 28 years old, staring at a toilet bowl full of blood and loss, crashing into depression. I cried for weeks, but I also practiced what to say when I saw God for the first time. It always starts with why, and there's a lot in between, but it always ends with fuck you. I learned about gravity when my husband left me 10 years ago. It shattered the world I thought I had. It unraveled so many of my belief systems. It started me down this path. I started letting my older kids swear, because why not? I started letting them eat cake before dinner, because why not? I started letting them get mediocre grades, because none of that mattered to me anymore. What mattered to me was the truth. And the truth was that cake before dinner and mediocre grades and swearing really said nothing about you as a person. And therefore, it was no longer a parenting priority to me. The littlest one, Charlotte, was seven at the time. The four of us had been on our own for the better part of a year, and at this point, Easter was coming. I was working multiple jobs, and I was tired. And I decided that the Easter bunny had to go. It was just another lie. It was just another way to create false reality. In our little family, well, we were above all that. So at dinner, two nights before Easter, I announced that we really all knew the Easter bunny wasn't real. And they didn't really want baskets full of fake eggs and trinkets. And instead, we were going to go to the store, and everyone was going to get a crisp $100 bill. They could get whatever they wanted. The older boys were thrilled. They couldn't believe the words coming out of my mouth. And I even remember one of them saying something to the effect of, divorce is the best. <laughs> so we packed up. We headed to the Walmart. The boys immediately run off to the electronics section together. And Charlotte and I walk towards the toys. When we get to the toys, she picks up a doll and puts it back. She picks up a board game and puts it back. She sees the Polly Pocket Dream House. It is exactly $99, and her eyes light up, and she inspects it all over, and she puts it back. Eventually, I'm getting pretty frustrated because the boys are back with these video games and candy, and they want to check out, and Charlotte still isn't choosing anything. And I say, baby, come on, choose anything you want. Let's grab it. we got to go. Now all three of us are following behind her, and we end up at the front of the store where they keep all the seasonal merchandise. She runs over to the aisle of Easter items and squeals with glee. There they are, she says. She grabs a pink basket and some green plastic grass and a pack of plastic eggs and a stuffed animal and the cheapest chocolate. And at this point, the universe is once again teaching me about gravity. My heart fell into the soles of my shoes, and even with more money than this girl had ever seen in her life, even with the prospect of a Polly Pocket dream house, this little girl still chose the lie. And in that moment, I knew that I was wrong. The importance of the Easter Bunny to her was actually about stability. And in an effort to gain my own strength and independence, this little girl taught me that for the better part of a year, I was continually destabilizing her world. She needed the bunny. She needed the plastic grass and the cheap chocolate. She needed to believe that this world could be a better place than it is. And what gravity taught me that day is that I also needed the world to be better than it was, even if that meant believing in a few lies. I have five kids now, four in college, and every year until the day I die, they will be receiving Easter baskets. <laughs> I read on the internet that you spend 18 years raising children, and once they move out, you have a combined total of two years with them, which is not even a portion of what I want, and about half as much as I deserve. Charlotte knew that at six years old, we could make this place better. Even on the days when our mouths were full of dirt and blood, we cry, but we still fly if we believe it.
Next up is uh, Jessica Manick, and I, Jessica is one of our friends from the Amesville Writers Workshop. And also, I always think of Jessica when we do something like this, because th this is for you. <laughs> I apologize for my voice. I hope I can make it through this. Um, I was so excited. I grew up just down the street, and mostly I was excited that I would have a chance to read a poem about growing up in Moon Township, in Moon Township. But this particular poem I found pinging off of so many of the other things the wonderful readers were sharing tonight. Um, and it's from an anthology that's coming out later this year. It's going to be in, in an anthology called Women Speak that is... Um, organized by the Ohio Poet Laureate and her project called Women of Appalachia. And they put an anthology out every year with um, hundreds of women from throughout the region sharing their stories. And I think, Professor Lucas, you have a piece in there, um, so look for that when it comes out. It's always a great mix of voices. And this is called Archaeology. We may as well have been Columbus, Da Gama, my brother and I, born into a world they called new, pastless, plastic, no photos on the walls, only tchotchkes on the mantles, only our fairy tales. We lived in a suburb sprung up around the airport, history free, formerly farms. We played outside in those days, banished to the kids' kingdom so mom could have her stories, days, one life to live, sharing a play-by-play -play with her sister over the phone. Other people's stories. Our shadowy corners were something to peroxide, to hide, create antidotes against. We made potions, mixed berries and petals. The hydrangeas bloomed their aluminum blue. We dug in the dirt in our yard. One day, unearthing trash, 1940s fires had failed to burn small glass vials, metal toothpaste tubes. We learned the people here had been wilder, only recently imposing the suburban order. In metal barrels, the trash burned out back, secrets vanishing quicker than s'mores. We spread out our evidence, asking questions. Who had been here before? Why had they left? What brought us here? What kept us here? We didn't know, our mother didn't even know, her grandmother was alive, confined to an asylum. We didn't know our grandmother's teenage pregnancy was the reason her family moved three states away one summer, sudden East Coasters. We only knew stories burbled under the surface, noses poking up through the sea foam. Baby detectives, we were unquenchable, skeptical, magnifying glassed, leaving no junk drawer unemptied, finding what there was to find. We scratched and scrabbled and scoured, asking only if we hadn't been meant to know, would we have been fitted with these little claws? Thank you. Hey, um, our next reader, uh, Hannah Kennedy. Well, hello. Um, I'm Hannah Kennedy. I work here. I teach comm skills. And I'm originally from Venango County, PA, um, Oil City. And um, the selection I wanted to read is called Samaritans. It was published this past winter in the Watershed Journal, which is a super local literary magazine that only publishes from like six counties of Pennsylvania in the PA Wilds region. So nobody knows about it except these people there. <laughs> right. Um, and Venango County is one of those counties. So this is sort of fiction, sort of nonfiction. We were talking a little about what the boundary between those things are. Uh, this is based on a real memory, um, and it's called Samaritans. I remember the day we hiked in the Allegheny National Forest along Minister Creek, nestled in the hills in the middle of nowhere. I remember how the tall, silent trees relinquished golden brown leaves each breeze shaking them loose, the chill as the wind whipped through from sun, some unforeseen place, how the sky was blue like clear, cold turquoise. We walked together, footfalls echoing in the reverent air. It was nearly winter, 
and frost ringed the slender streams, and we were so surprised to see the sun. I remember how chunks of stone glittered on the trail, how we gathered it like fruit to take home, along with the slender hemlock shoots you were always stealing. Do you remember how the giant rocks made caves at the top of the mountain? The enormous stones surrounded our trail like the arches of an ancient cathedral. We scrambled onto them and stood at the top and saw the valley fall away, and we told each other stories of the first peoples. I remember how the trees grew up along the rocks, weaving and braiding and twining. You wanted to climb them like a ladder, and I begged for a more sensible way. I remember sliding on dead leaves and smooth rock back down the hill, the rush of mingled fear and glee. Do you remember how we found the woman lost in the woods, the one abandoned by the Boy Scouts, left behind, an unwanted chaperone? Do you remember her cries echoing in the valley, how we thought she was an animal at first, a kidnapper perhaps, or worse, some spirit of backwoods legend? We let her walk with us to drink our water. We led her on the trail through the valley and up the hill. We found the Boy Scouts, the dozen or so little men, the handful of grown men with them, all of them surprised they had left the woman behind. We thought you were with us, they said to her. We didn't notice you had gone. She thanked us profusely, and we went on our merry way to live out the rest of our perfect day. As I recall, we never got her name. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And then our last reader for tonight is Joshua. And could you help me with your last name? Tarquinia. Tarquinia. Okay, thank you. Hi. I'm an alum. Heard about this on Facebook. Friends of Heather. Figured I'd come. I, uh, I'm more of a prose writer, but every once in a while a poem falls out of me. Um, and this poem I was going to uh, do out of town, I had a friend in Philly who was having a poetry night, and I never actually made it there, but as I was thinking about like what I could do for the, for the Philly thing, I, I, the, the line, I drove here from Pittsburgh, like stuck in my head. I was like, oh, I could write a poem about that. And then that sort of started to parlay into, oh, like, okay, so like everybody who's never been to Pittsburgh tends to think it's dirty and everything, so I could like play off of that or whatever, and then it kind of, the poem kind of got away from me and it turned into being a more symbolic thing. But anyway, here it is. I drove here from Pittsburgh. It took longer than I wanted, but not as long as I expected. It was dreary when I left the Scotland of America. Gray clouds wrung out gray tears in another day that ends in why, just because. Rock and roll rung out, railed against the rat-a-tata, pit a pat a splatter, spiteful, spitting, fighting, gritted teeth bared against the biting, blinding barrage. I drove here from Pittsburgh, a trisected city stitched together with steel staples you could stack steam trains on, but sometimes it floods. Like when the snow melts and the spring storms sweep across the steep hills and the deep, deep valleys, raising the rivers, dumping detritus on the daily disparaged. And the safe suburbanites sit soundly in suede loungers saying, why don't they just move? I drove here from Pittsburgh. It was worse than I wanted, but not as bad as I thought. Sure, the days were gray, but they were gray from rain, not the bane of furnace flames, not the black snowflakes that laid on and stained street bay window panes. How do I know whether I've been waterboarded or baptized? A Pittsburgh preacher turned TV host turned the phrase, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Maybe he knew the difference. I guess it depends which way the rivers wend, since the confluence is the heart and the current, the soul, and the whole surrender thing is antithetical to instinct, to ambition, and to drive. I drove here. Thank you. Right, well, I want to thank Sarah, Jessica, Hannah, and Joshua, and also then Jody, Megan, and Jolene for coming out. And just one last thing, because it's you know sometimes it's it's easy to get frustrated, especially in this day and age, and in academia too. But I can remember when Dr. Penson and Dr. Pambuki and I, this was, and this was five years ago, 
we were trying to think about you know, what, how we needed to redo things. And so we hit this idea of community. And we're, that's what we wanted to stress. And we redid 2000, so that it was, uh, which is our introduction to some of my, um, Philip is in that class, the introduction to the study of literature as a, as a cohort building class. And you never know how that stuff is gonna go. And then we brought Megan on board. And Megan's big thing is having a writer community. And so how are we going to use our writing classes and a certificate to create a sense of community? And you never know how that's gonna go. But then I've got three of my students here, <laughs> stalwart till the end. And I think, this is actually working. <laughs> so, so thank you guys for coming and staying. All right, well, thank you again for a wonderful evening, and uh, let's do this again. <laughs>